we are going to be talking about preparing for the reopen of schools. My name is Kevin Stoller. I'm owner of a company called K12, where we focus on creating better learning environments. And um, I also host a podcast called Better Learning. And it's really kind of a lot of this. We want to learn from what's going on in school. So this kind of happened from our team who talks to schools around the country and hearing different perspectives of what they're dealing with and trying to plan for the fall. So this really kind of started out of us internally as our team saying, we want to ask questions. We want to hear what, what others are doing. So we put together a panelist of different people from around the country geographically and also diverse in, in uh, how they're approaching uh, different aspects of education. And I don't want to spend a lot of time, my time talking through here because I want to hear what the panelists have. So we did ask them to address three different things here. Um, and so before I get into that, um, I am going to put up a poll because I want to hear from from uh, everyone who's in the audience here as well of how they're handling it. So we'll keep this up here until uh, after the panelists go through, but we asked them to look at, look at it from three different main questions. We wanted to have them share their experience so far with what, what the schools and the classrooms are going to look like for the upcoming school year and the positive and negative effects that they see the results from these changes that we're gonna see. And then the last thing is, is any advice or any kind of sharings that they found that would be useful to other schools um, during this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in here. And Robin, um, if you wanna go ahead, your background, everyone can kind of read your background and go ahead and uh, right. give us your insights. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me, Kevin. It's great to be here. And I think um, this is the first pandemic for all of us. So how we come out of it and reshape uh, education is really important. So our previous mayor in Chicago said, never uh, let a good cri crisis go to waste. And so here we are um, trying to re-enter school and um, safely social distance. And um, there are a lot of good things happening in terms of hygiene. And uh, so we're adding um, those kind of elements, but we're looking at this opportunity to also reshape the way the future of learning looks. Um, one of the things that we're doing is looking at decluttering the classroom, removing as many objects and clutter as we can because then we don't have to clean that. Um, and then specifically looking at ways of reclustering and, and kind of hearkening back to those pre-industrial times with Maria Montessori and Reggio Emilia um, and looking at hands-on learning stations all the way up through high school and higher ed and beyond. Um, so reshaping and redesigning the classroom in those standards is, is, is what we're looking at and what we're, we're projecting. Um, you asked what some of the positive and the negatives are. Um, we're, we're looking on the bright side of, of having this opportunity to redesign, but of course some of the negatives are um, we have school districts that are calling us, can you just do a test fit and cram as many students as you can with a six foot radius so that we've got the social distancing. And um, so the negative out of that is we're, we're looking at individual deaths again um, for some of our school districts. And, and that's really unfortunate because it doesn't lead to collaboration. It, it's um, really more about separation instead of socialization. So um, I, would, I would point that out as a negative uh, outcome here. Um, and then we're looking to the future of ways that um, class or that furniture can be separated and then also come together. So soft seating um, is a challenge because of the, the um, sterilization and the clean cleanliness. Um, but I think, uh, again, I'll just close with this is an opportunity to reshape the way we learn technology. We have proven that e-learning can work. And so a hybrid learning strategy is what's developing. And I think there are lots of opportunities to reshape space around that um, and putting less people in a classroom and finding those project-based learning opportunities and, and cleaning out those corners so that the corners can be the place where students can learn and collaborate in a safe way. 
I'll stop there. And then if there are some follow-up questions, please let me know. Sounds good. Thank you, Robin. And yeah, to that point, um, I know I'm already seeing, if you have questions, go ahead and put it within there and we're gonna make sure we have time at the end here to address questions. So John Morgan, you wanna hop in next? I've got, a, there's a level of frustration in that we are preparing for what we've not been told what we're allowed to do. We don't know what our parameters are in Ohio as of yet. We, um, we're we hearing that within the next nine to 10 days, we'll be given some sort of guidance as to, okay, one, can all my kids come back um, every day? Um, if they come back, do I have to try and keep them six feet apart? Um, how you do that with five and six and seven year olds, that'll be a really good trick. Um, are, are we going to be on an A-B schedule? Um, you know, you're talking about the design of the, of the classroom. I don't know how many kids I can put in there. Um, are we looking at taking, taking some desks out of the room to create more space in between the desks for the who knows how many kids I'm allowed to have in each room? Uh, we, we had a, a a district wide meeting we'd invited all the anybody who works here could come this morning just to talk about what do we think it's going to look like and trying to have that conversation and not knowing what any of the where any of the lines are drawn for us is extremely frustrating right now um, of course our kindergarten registration got wiped out in april and i have parents calling every day wanting to because we we put it we postponed it. Well, they want to know, well, when are we going to have it? And I said, well, they haven't told us when we're allowed to have kids back in the building yet. So we sort of have an idea of rough draft of what we might do for that. But that's the same thing we have. We have a plan in place for what if we have to stay online? Um, what if we are allowed to bring all of our kids back? What if they're on an A-B schedule? And then when you get into the A-B schedule, you're looking at the child care factor, um, we got to make sure all the siblings come on the same day because the, the older kid may be the child care provider on the off day they're not in class. I mean, just all of these different little things. What do we do with uh, students with exceptional needs? I mean, do they come every day? Do they not? Do we, we've got all of these questions and we don't have answers because we don't know what the rules to the game are yet. And that is extremely frustrating for us on the inside. I can only imagine what um, my parents are feeling right now as, as to what's the year going to look like. Um, that's a $64,000 question. Really, I don't know what it's gonna look like. Um, I'll let you know when they tell us. <laughs> Basic, I'll, 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 we'll figure something out. And John, before I move on to the next one, is it coming from the state, like this, like actually like the governor or more from like the Department of Education that you're kind of waiting on, on answers from? Well, it was um, in our state, um, our state health director, um, Dr. Acton, I, I think she might have drafted, the, made the order and then the governor signs it. it it's, it's a combination between Dr. Acton and uh, Governor DeWine. They were the ones who shut down our buildings on, um, oh goodness, March 16th was the last day that kids were allowed in our building. On the 17th and 18th, we had two days of uh, teacher-driven uh, peer PD on if you don't know how to do the Google Classroom, boom, I come on over here. They were helping each other. They were putting lessons together. And on, the, on Thursday the 19th, we were rolling. Yeah. And right. that was just the world as we know it. And I think the closure goes officially through June 30th, I believe. Okay. And so that might be what's kind of pushing the nine or 10 days are going to tell us what we're allowed to do. Sounds we good. currently have um, athletic trainings going on on campus now, um, you gotta get your temperature taken and they ask you a series of questions about how you're feeling today and 
then they go run around out on track or they're playing basketball or uh, I think we had some basketballers in this morning. Cool. So All right. Well, well, thanks, John. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll probably dig into more of that in the Q and A here. So thanks, John. Um, Jeff, you want to give your perspective? Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Uh, my name is Jeff Bradbury. I'm a middle school teacher in Norwalk Public Schools in Connecticut. Um, last year was an amazing year. It was my first year in the district, and I teach broadcasting and technology education, and I have an amazing large learning space. I was very excited that we brought in you know, connected seating and everybody was on benches and we were able to do mobile furniture, the whole deal. And learning from last year how to put all this together, how to actually teach in a collaborative environment. And one of the other things that I do with my broadcasting kids is that we, we do morning announcements. And so now over the last 15 weeks and probably for the next seven or eight weeks, I'm, I'm redesigning all of my lessons, not to be collaborative, but to figure out how can we do this? Um, kind of, I, I have these ideas where I'd like to have the appearance of normalcy the best that I can. I think that there's a way to on, on camera show that two people are sitting next to each other, even though they might be in totally separate rooms on green screens. Um, trying to figure out how, how, to, how to do my program differently. Um, everything that we do is collaborative. I, I, I echo what, what my colleagues here on the panel say of, you know, things are gonna be different and I wish I knew where we were. We might be at an A, B schedule. We might be at an A morning, B afternoon schedule. I, I have no idea what to do. Um, but when you're looking at having a, an environment where you're dealing with, you know, robots and technology and all, all these great things coming together, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward. I'm hopeful. I know that we're going to have a great a, a year ahead of us in whatever capacity. Um, but, you know, like everybody else, I'm kind of concerned with what's going on and how we're going to get there. Okay. And Emily, you want to go ahead and take the next one here? Sure. I'm Emily Frozy. I am stationed down here in Dallas, Texas. And um, I can echo what everybody else has been saying, but I think my conversations over the last three months have really taken three different, um, fallen into three different buckets. And that's one, learning can happen anytime, anywhere. Um, education and educators are the most resilient humans and in industry there is. And we don't know what we don't know, right? And so um, we, like you, John, are waiting for the commissioner of education to let us know what is gonna be allowed back in the actual school building but um, our conversations, I work with a small team um, at the DLR group called the BOLD team and we're building organizational learning and design. And what we do is we really look at how the instruction and your environment align and how you can leverage both to get the most out of each. And so really looking, talking to our clients about, you know, if you're in a virtual world, what does that learning look like? Because all too often we know you can't just put a virtual worksheet on a screen and hope a kid does it and gets it and learns something from it. So really, you know, if, if we're going back face to face, what does that instructional design look like with, you know, six to 10 humans in a space with a teacher, or if we're allowed to have 22 to 25, what can we, you know, expect in that situation? And then what if the world shuts down again? How do you pivot back to a virtual learning space? Or how do you walk into August in a hybrid 50-50? This group of kids is here, this cohort is here on Tuesday, that sort of thing. So really just looking deeply at the instruction, the instructional practice, the instructional design, and how it aligns with the environment, either face-to-face, -face, um, traditional schoolhouse, or online. So um, we're just really leaning on, you know, what the CDC and the state says we can do and gearing up towards that. Okay, thank you, Emily. Yeah, I can, we can talk more about the CDC later too, of how many people are taking that kind of as the main guidance. Yeah, and it's it, tough. Yeah, it is. All right, Paul. All right, well, good morning. Um, my name is Paul Guignon and I'm from uh, Arizona, a little uh, area called Queen Creek, um, just outside of Phoenix. And uh, anyway, as far as 
this goes, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we've been through a lot of growth, um, a lot of pivoting, let's say, <laughs> um, is, is the word we use in our district um, to, you know, just, it, it's amazing how adaptable, I think Emily put it really well, how adaptable um, we've become as educators um, in shifting our instruction uh, to online really like that, right? So um, kudos to all the teachers, um, all the administrators uh, that are on this call for all the hard work that, that they did uh, to close out uh, the school year. So, you know, in, in terms of looking at this upcoming school year, our district has uh, formed a committee and then looked at subcommittees uh, within that big committee to explore what learning looks like or what um, design, you know, of the, the classrooms looks like, um, what lunch looks like next year. Uh, we are um, a school district that um, goes on the, we're on the modified year round calendar. And so, you know, like Kevin pointed out, we are um, starting school July 22nd. And, you know, that's, that's pretty soon. It's just around the corner, right? So we've got to have a, a good plan. Um, we're, we're being told, you know, from a, a district level that, you know, sometime by July 1st, uh, we'll have a, a solid plan in, in place um, through those different stakeholders' um, feedback and, and everything like that. So I'm really um, anxious to, to see what that entails. Like a lot of people have, have already um, discussed, you know, we just kind of want to know um, as much as we can so that we can plan and prepare um, to be successful and, and to put our kids and, and definitely our educators um, in a, you know, in a good position to stay healthy and, and so on. Um, positive, um, you know, kind of outcomes here that, that we've seen already is, is like I said, the, the growth, um, you know, as educators, we always practice the growth mindset, right? Like we're, it's always a continuous cycle of improvement. And, and I think that I've seen a lot of growth with my faculty and with my, uh, administrators and the people with whom I work. And then, um, you know, any drawbacks that I see, you know, we're, we're an AVID school, like it says on my bio there. And, and a lot of um, AVID strategies or collaborative strategies is two, you know, two kids working together do a, do, doing a think, pair, share, or a turn and talk, whatever the case may be. And, and uh, it's going to be hard to, to do that. But I think with some of the growth that we've seen of online tools where we can collaborate digitally, um, even within the same class. And we are a one-to-one -one school um, on our campus. You know, I, I think that that'll take that negative um, away. Um, any advice that I would say as I wrap up here um, to the leaders on the, on the call, you know, first use your network, you know, just look at what other people, uh, other districts or the principals, you know, are, are doing um, around you. I think that's how we all learn best, right? We, you know, hear a great idea from a conference or whatever and, and take it and incorporate it. Um, and then lastly, you know, it's really about the people um, in front of the kids um, doing the work. And so making sure they're involved, um, kind of lockstep. I mean, even though it's summer for us, I've uh, been texting away with my leadership team and I tell them, hey, I don't want to bother you, but, you know, I, I want you to be aware um, always of kind of the next move and so on and so forth. So th those would be my two pieces of advice. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I, mean, I, I think that's um, such a unique aspect of of doing that. Is you, you're you're hitting it from so many different angles as kind of the leaders and the principals and the administrators of so many different aspects. That well, I, I know I'm already seeing some of the Q and A. There's going to be more about that. So, Sylvia, want to? Yeah, Jump in here you. next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having us. And I'm Sylvia Kowak. I'm in Chicago. I'm a director of interior design for Legal Architects. And one of the things, the experience that we've been having is that basically this time is time to reimagine. It's we all reimagining, we're all reinventing, and we're creating. It's really time to discuss how to open the schools in a safe and healthy way, but also in an inspiring way. Like, don't forget. That that's what school is about. Um, so right now we are in a reacting mode where we talk about the physical space and how to change that physical space. But we don't have to forget that the unity of the school is when we actually relay 
for the physical, the cognitive, and the emotional well-being of the students. So it, it's a mix. Right now, we're just doing the physical, but we just don't, let's not forget what's important in a school. So in this reacting mode, what we're doing is we all talk about the social distancing, physical separation, you know, where to put sanitizing stations, uh, how the staggered schedules are going to be, uh, how is this going to impact transportation, food service, and even you know, just going to the restrooms. Um, how many permanent um, partitions are going to be there, if they're going to be permanent or if they're not. Um, as Jeff mentioned, how many students are going to fit within a classroom? Some of the studies that we've been doing, we've been uh, working with universities and pre-K-12s. We're looking at 33%, 35% occupancy per classroom after we do our study. It's also not just the classroom, but the traffic flow within the classroom, but within the building. Because it's not just being in the classroom, it's how do you get to the classroom in a safety way. So again, these are all just physical um, things reacting to a situation, you know, and all the mechanical, the air system and the air ventilation and, you know, the access to the outdoors and opening the windows. So it's all physical, but let's not forget that what's the, the main goal. And the main goal is to really look at the ecosystem of education in your building that is just not physical. It's how do we get to that collaboration and what students are expecting from a school. And I believe it's time to ask the questions on why we have done five days a week forever. Why is it 24 to 30 students per classroom? Is that the good solution? Is, it, is this change giving us the opportunity to th think forward, to think different, to use technology and to actually create something instead of trying to go back to what we had? Maybe something that we need to do is to learn what we had and look to what we can have after learning all this, um, everything that we have learned in, in the last three months. So I think one of the strengths is that the interdesign for education is not just going to be based in you know, the physical beauty and function, but it's also gonna be based on the community knowledge of healthcare providers, community members, faculty, so it's everybody kind of putting their heads together in order to make a perfect solution. And what my advice will be for all of us is we need to breathe, we need to think, and we need to open our minds to, we need to think outside the box because maybe we have a great opportunity to not just change the physical world, and this is an interior designer talking, but to actually improve how education has been for the last 40 years. Thank you, Sylvia. I love the optimism and the positivity. I, I agree with you. We've been saying a lot of us have been saying like there needs a lot of change in education. And, you know, I think we've just proven that the whole system can change really quick in the matter of 48 mm -hmm. hours. And yeah. can we use this as an opportunity to, to really improve education? So thank you. All right, Austin. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I Love, <clears throat> sorry, I loved um, what I just heard from um, from Sylvia, and a lot of kind of what I I have to say echoes uh, quite a bit of what what she said. But I think you know to answer the first question, I think that um, like clearly um, the the new how we're imagining a physical space um, it needs to be. I'm hearing a lot of conversation about hybrid. Um, you know, things that are really flexibility, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, and I think that the theme of what this, like Sylvia was saying, what, of what, the, what we're going through um, has taught us, and I think the way we can take advantage is, me, like, the theme is meeting students where they are, right? So whether that has to do with health and safety, um, we need to meet students where they are. Whether that has to do with the physical design of a classroom, we need to meet students where they are better. And then also like the thing that I specialize in and my company specializes in is that we meet students where they are in terms of, um, we've created a, an, an ed tech tool that teaches students vocabulary and helps them build literacy skills 
using hip hop and popular music. So our whole model um, is to meet students where they are in terms of, I guess, pedagogy, but through an app. Um, so just in terms of my point of view, I'm a big proponent of meeting students where they are. And I think that that theme, um, this is a huge opportunity in our reimagining of how we enter back into the classroom, how we re-engage with, um, you know, K-12 education. We have a chance right now in many different disciplines to apply this motto of truly meeting students where they are. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that kind of is like answers like all three questions in a way, but I really do believe that um, like one thing that happened during the, the pandemic um, that we can, we can really learn from is a big challenge is engaging students, right? Like a student on Zoom can put their Zoom on, mute and blank and go on Instagram and things like that, right? Um, although, you know, students will be in the physical space of a classroom, we still need to treat them like we could lose their attention very quickly because that's happening in person as well. So we need to apply the same creativity. Um, you know, although there may not be as many challenges as like distance learning in terms of keeping engagement, um, we need to still apply that. And I think that this situation has given us um, an opportunity to double down in our efforts to engage students, make them feel comfortable um, and uh, excited to, to be in school. Awesome. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, I, I wanted to hear your perspective because I like that too, of just meeting students where they're at right now because looking at the whole student obviously is, is the biggest challenge that our educators have right now. So thank you. One other thing before I move on to the next one, um, I saw some people raising their hand. If you guys just want to go ahead and just type your questions into that, because we'll get to the Q and A sec, uh, session here as we wrap up soon um, through the panels. And then, um, and then the poll, if you have not answered the poll questions too, I took a sneak peek on that and it's fascinating to see the results there. So if you haven't answered the poll ones, go ahead before uh, and we'll, we'll share those here in a little bit. So William, you wanna take the, take the control here? Yeah, oh, I look like Zoolander in that picture, nice. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I think that this gets kind of meta because we're from all around the country and we're sharing ideas. And I think that um, th when, we, when we do distance learning, uh, you know, something like Zoom, that in some ways actually expands your classroom and we can, do, we can you know, really connect with people that we wouldn't normally be able to connect with if we weren't doing remote learning. So I don't, you know, I think we can just kind of, I love what Sylvia was saying about like, let's rethink this. Uh, I'm just a classroom teacher. so. I am glad I'm not making the calls that you administrators and people in the district have to make because it's it doesn't seem like anyone really knows anything about where, where we're going to be or anything like that. There's so much uncertainty that we have to just roll with it best that we can. Um, I'm at a private school right now and a lot of um, families are pulling their, their kids out because it's very expensive and they're you know, the idea of just, if we're going to, my kid's going to be at home on Zoom, why am I paying whatever they're paying? It's like $40,000 a year. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so I think we're all, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is, is whatever situation I'm in, they're, they're talking about maybe doing a blended thing where they have like, it's a high school. So like nine and 10, ninth and 10th graders come these days of the week. And then 11th and 12th, these days of the week, I teach upperclassmen and uh, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there are some problems that we have in this country. And I think that this gets very, uh, it, gets, it gets very useful that we can, I, at least because I have upper, upperclassmen, so I have mostly 12th graders, is to look at all of these things going on from COVID, from everything going on with protests and things like that. There's a lot of issues that we can kind of get these young minds thinking about solving these problems. And you know, the idea of, of project-based learning and all that kind of stuff, um, connecting with people 
uh, that are that have you know different backgrounds and experiences from different neighborhoods and all that kind of stuff from all around the country. I think that we can we can do more of that, and uh, and and maybe get rid of some of the anti more antiquated elements of education. But um, I think that the idea of going less theory and more into practical application is probably going to be something good. I think that there's a lot of students that struggle with caring about school and they have so many things in front of them that they're interested in that why would they pay attention to physics class or something like that or history class unless they directly connect it to something that will benefit them like right now. And with everything going on in the country, you know, this directly connects, I'm a history teacher, so it's like directly connects to history. We can connect what's happening right now out on the streets and the tensions and all that kind of stuff with history. Um, we need, you know, uh, things in, in certain neighborhoods. They need a, a playground or something like that. Well, what kind of science and art and all these kinds of things would go into designing a playground? Like, I just think that we have like free labor <laughs> in our students that, it can become a win-win all around where, where we're helping out, helping to solve the problems or at least think about the problems in a real like critical way. We're getting them to, to do work that they can apply like right away, like, okay, this is, I can see where this is going. It's not theoretical. Uh, we keep them busy. I just think that we just have to be efficient with what we have. So I'm glad to be here and, and you know, go over these ideas and stuff like that because uh, I think it, it could be a real opportunity if we choose to view it that way. For sure. Thank you, William. Yeah. Karen. Trying to unmute you. And I think we're doing it at the same time. So you go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, hi. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for uh, having me. I'm going to give you a little of my background. I'm a recently retired uh, sixth grade teacher of ELA and social studies uh, from the West Hempstead, New York public school. Um, I was uh, the inclusion in an inclusion uh, co-teaching model. And as far as uh, the positives that we saw with this um, distance learning was that we really collaborated with our colleagues and we really allowed um, a divide and conquer kind of situation, got together, made lots of project-based um, assignments and that was really, really great. We worked with younger and older teachers and uh, had lots of different great ideas that we were able to um, put together. So that was a great experience. Um, one thing that someone on the panel said was, we now have the chance to remove the clutter if we do go back. And, and that is true because we had nothing through distance learning. So why, why do we need all of this clutter? We were able to use a lot of the um, tools that that companies provided with us uh, for us and got a taste of that for for free which was wonderful and um, could see that that we really don't need those textbooks we really don't need um, workbooks and, and um, worksheets and it doesn't work so uh, we really were able to redesign and, and rethink uh, those different lessons. So that was a, a good positive. Um, in our inclusion support classroom, we had different stations, our physical space, had stations and flexible seating and beanbag chairs and tables. And unfortunately, if we do go back to the classroom, they are thinking of putting those desks back in because of the six feet um, social distancing. They're thinking of, uh, you know, having students wear masks, which can be so difficult, hot and sweaty, and, and um, how are our special needs kids that, that have issues with claustrophobia and things that are on their face, how are they going to take to that? So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, 
it's definitely challenging. It's frustrating. We don't know what September brings because uh, right now we're in that what if state. Our district's putting together a survey. Are we coming back? Are we doing the A, B thing? Are we, are we going to use the gym space as part of the classroom? We don't know. And it is frustrating. Committees are being formed. That's good because the community members and, and teachers, administrators are working together to come up with different ideas. And I think that's a positive uh, as well because many people's minds together, I think, make for, uh, for better conditions and situations. So, so that's good. Unfortunately, some negatives, especially here in New York where we, we don't know right now what's going on um, as far as are we going back to school in September or not? We really don't uh, know. So uh, if we continue with the distance learning, many of our students did kind of disappear. They went off the grid and never to be heard from or seen from uh, uh, before that whole three month time. And that was a problem especially with our special ed population. How, how can we have that relationship? Um, how, can, how can we take those facial clues from those special ed kids? Very, very difficult. Uh, and, and that is my biggest concern with the special needs population. Um, forming relationships and um, really helping them because they do need, they do need uh, their curriculum modified and that's, that's where we're at here. Okay. That's and, my biggest concern. Yeah, well, thank you, Karen. And, and it kind of segue into it as we go into the Q&A, um, kind of I thought your perspective would be good because the poll that came out last week from USA Today was that up to 20% of our teachers have no intentions of returning back to the classrooms. And that may be kind of one of the first questions that I put out there is, are you guys seeing this, um, you know, for, a, you know, a variety of reasons, are, are you seeing it, planning for it? Um, of the, you know, the fact that you may have a, a big reduction in staff coming here at a time where before we were in a pretty big teacher shortage. So maybe I'm gonna put that question out there first and then I'm gonna go through some of these other ones. And if anyone wants to kind of jump in and, and answer that from the perspective of, do, you know, do we, do we really think that's gonna happen? And, um, and then kind of as you guys answer that, anyone who hasn't finished the poll, go ahead and uh, finish the poll because I'm gonna share the answers, uh, share the poll results. Um, I'll jump in, at least in my perspective or, or with my staff, I haven't heard that. Um, they definitely want to know, you know, what the plan is and what the safeguards are in place. And I think that's only fair. Um, so that's why, again, that work ahead of time is, is really critical. Uh, but at, at least in our district, um, I've not heard uh, too many teachers um, expressing that sentiment. I'm an architect, but I have been in communication with a lot of school districts recently on this topic. And recently, a large school district in Ohio, Hilliard, uh, did a survey and 15% of their students are not going to be returning for a variety of reasons because of risk, but also parents wanting to do homeschooling and other things. And what they discovered is they're about at 15% um, for their teachers as well. So those teachers that are at risk or concerned, they're going to be putting together the e-learning academy and instructing the students that are not coming back. And then they're prepared to do a hybrid re-entry depending on the direction of the governor and, and the State Board of Education there in Ohio. Um, and maybe our Ohio teacher can, can speak more to that. But, um, that they're also pulling in um, an epidemiologist to discuss kind of how um, the uh, COVID is spread and, and what are the safeguards that they need to be doing. I think there's been a lot of research on that topic recently and it's mostly airborne transmit 
mid mittens. So um, upping the game in terms of mechanical, Sylvia mentioned that. I mean, air exchange is going to be important. Um, and then unfortunately, I think the masks are going to be something that we're going to have to start out with unless someone proves that they're, they're not effective because they certainly uh, affect the spread by sneeze, they're guarding sneezing and coughing. So that's, um, that's just the data that I wanted to share uh, in terms of the reentry program and related to this hybrid uh, model that most schools are gonna, if they, if they are going to have a fall program, um, it's going to be a hybrid program is what we've heard. Okay. Yeah, and it, I'm just going through kind of these poll results here of the people that are on the call. So it looks like 84% um, do plan to start school at the usual start date. Um, of the ones that did send out surveys, so it looks like 45 percent of the people of the schools here sent out surveys super fascinating to see that it's kicking mm -hmm. out um yeah a big percentage of saying less than 75 percent of the students um of, of the parents plan to send their students back um making a decision has your district made a decision on whether any of the following will be required and it looks like we got a variety of things, but it seems like a lot of the things that the CDC is recommending as far as uh, facial coverings, um, the distancing, sanitary stations. Um, it looks like class, it looks like a variety of different options that we're seeing here. So that's good if you guys should be able to see those results there just to kind of see some of the different things that we're doing here. Um, yeah, and who has access to devices, definitely a big concern of for the ones who don't have access to, to devices. Um, let me go into some of these other questions here and as you guys go through here, um, one of the questions uh, from Ann Sullivan is that, and this is what's fascinating around the country too, is there, today is their last day of school in Massachusetts where we're almost a month away from starting again in Arizona. Um, but next week they're gonna start forming reopening committees uh, to try to look at how to determine this. What different committees do you think are necessary to cover all our bases? Anyone want to jump in kind of what committees they've seen, um, either within their district or heard from others? Well, um, it was just this morning we had our uh, first kind of like a district-wide um, gathering. Any employee in the district um, just to gather ideas of, you know, what worked for what we did in the spring, uh, what challenges we see coming in the fall. Uh, one of the teachers asked, am I gonna not be allowed to go over to a student's desk and help them, help him or her if, you know, he or she has a question? Because where are the, are we gonna, be stuck six feet away from every human that's in the building with us. Um, it, it's going to change how you interact with kids, how, how, how we do what we do. Um, what committees? I mean, we, we had our transportation director there uh, who also oversees the, the maintenance, and that's going to be a huge piece of what goes on here in the fall. Um, the teachers had all the administrators. Um, we're not to a point where we're going to open it up um, to parents and community just yet because we we haven't really determined our direction. I mean, we're shooting in the dark. We don't know what what are the rules going to be. What are the parameters going to be? How many are going to be allowed in? I mean, that's the frustrating part. You know, we're having this conversation, and we just had our first conversation this morning as a district because we just don't know what we're gonna be allowed to do. We're gonna be prepared for any scenario. You know, we'll have plan A, plan B, plan C, probably a D, E, and F along with it. Um, there's no set committees. I think the, the important thing is to get, uh, get your staff having conversations first off. The different committees will break off as needs arrive. I, I, arise. I, I wouldn't create a committee that may or may not need to exist. Okay. 
So in my district, I've been working over the last couple of weeks with a team of other tech coaches. Sorry, my velociraptor here. Um, on professional development. And right now we're working on creating a series of videos, lessons, so that way if a teacher is in the classroom, they've got things to do. And also if the teacher's doing a hybrid method, they've got a, a variety of how to do something, when to do something, and where to do something. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to work out the best that we can for professional development to make sure that everybody, no matter what they're working on and how they're teaching, it has something. And it's we're also creating them not only just for the teachers to learn how to do stuff, but also for the parents to be able to learn how to, you know, use these applications and help out their kids, no matter what the age is. Okay. And then um, a question here about, do you think we should allow students to, what are we going to be doing about students who have like low immunity or have some, so is more at risk health wise? And you know, Robin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I think I spoke to it. it there's going to be a percentage of, of students that are going to need to stay home and if they're um, at risk. And I think a lot of parents want to look at that. And I, um, as Sylvia also said, she's talking about community spaces. I know our church is looking at becoming a larger childcare facility because we're located right across the street from a school. So there will need to be community areas. And if a, a child is at risk, they might be able to, to have a better care environment, either at home or in another facility so that they're not exposed to um, the larger population of, of children. So that's, that's the direction that we've been hearing from our school districts. Um, we actually have a student on here who wanted to share, and I want to pronounce, I hope I pronounce right, Lulola. I'm gonna see if I can allow you to talk here and mute yourself if you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yep, we can hear you. Hi. Um, so I have a question. I know that a lot of students, um, well, in my school also, get a little distracted and maybe sometimes they won't follow the rules like to keep six feet apart or something. So are we going to have like um, lunch or is it going to be different? Like, is are we still going to have teachers in the classroom? Are we still going to like share ideas or is it going to be like totally different? I can take that. I think um, it's going to be totally different. You'll be able to be with your friend group. Uh, ho hopefully there'll be some zones of your friends in your neighborhood that you're already being exposed to will be the, the children that you're going to school with. Um, the food situation is probably going to be eating in the classroom um, or, you know, having spaces that are very much spaced out um, in terms of the food and it may end up being um, bagged lunch instead of hot food. Um, so it just depends. Uh, the safety measures from the CDC, the recommendations that we're getting are that students need to social distance in the same way that you've been learning in your community. Um, so you will need to be able to wear a mask and, and separate. That's, that's the direction that um, European schools have been operating and they're gonna, almost all of the European and Asian um, countries are back to school and that's the, the protocol that they're following. You'll still be able to communicate, you'll still have your friends, but your teacher um, will need to social distance with you as well, unless there's some sort of uh, separation. I've heard about these portable plexiglass screens that the teachers can take to your desk and look over your work with you and collaborate, but still have some physical separation. Mm -hmm. um, and you shouldn't be scared. It's still gonna be a place to learn from your friends and from your teachers. It's just, um, we have to follow some protocols because we don't wanna put you at risk. We wanna keep you safe. I, I, Thank you. I, I love that answer. Are, are, you still, are you still on the line here? Yeah. Um, so I know we were talking a little bit earlier through email. Would you be able to share with everybody where you are right now? What um, part of yes, I'm from, I'm from Kuwait. So that puts a whole new spin on things. Yeah. 
And are you hearing anything from your school in particular? Do you, do you go into a, cl like, are you doing remote learning now or are you doing? We finished online school actually. Um, we did online school. We, the last day was actually um, last month. And then we also got report cards, but we haven't heard anything from that point. So I was wondering if we're you know, you know, gonna have anything changing or anything like that because I know that some schools already started doing tests um, on laptop by laptops, but our school, we still use paper for tests. So is that going to change or I don't really know. I think the easiest answer is yes, everything is going to change. Yeah. But I think also it's going to change, especially right now, but little by little it's going to get better and better and better because yeah. Right. And right now you're at home and your friends yeah. are at home. So the next step is you're actually gonna to be together in a place, separated, you know, social distancing, but you are now together. So little by little, things are just gonna get better and better and better. So it's just having a little bit of patience and helping yourself be safe and helping your friends around be safe. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining and thank asking you. questions. Um, some of the other questions that are in here and, and see this is a perfect one virtual class management does anyone want to talk about doing that as I'm trying to figure this out for the first time when I have people raising hands and chats and comments going through um, William did you want to handle that one of how virtual class classroom yeah, management just real quickly um, you know I think that and this sounds really like overly simplistic I think but I think you have to just connect with the students as much as possible. And um, because it, even with remote learning, I have, I have like lunch every day, I have lunch with one, a different student every day. So uh, like I am doing that remotely. So I think that classroom management is just gonna be better when a kid is really struggling, like with, with paying attention to a Zoom meeting, which I get, um, then just trying to just talk to them as best you can and really just try and connect with them of what's going on, what can I do to help you, all that kind of stuff. From, I've been in classroom 15 years, which is longer than some of you and, and less than most of you, but um, I found just a tr tremendous advantage when I, when I connect with the kids that, I'm, that, that are having classroom management issues. I just kind of like, <laughs> sounds really bad to say, force myself on them. But like, you know, just kind of put myself like, you know, around them and, and just try and get to know them and what's going on with them and things like that. So I think that that's just going to have to probably get ramped up a little bit more as we're going to have to invest in, in them as individuals. And then they, they seem to have less um, disrespect. They don't want to disrespect you because they feel respected by you. Yeah, one thing if I could add too, I heard from another principal um, somewhere else in the country is, you know, <clears throat> having, you know, your classroom norms, just like you would in, in a normal kind of setup, but, you know, have those online too and have things that, you know, the students in the class can agree to. Um, I, I love William's uh, relationship uh, based approach there, you know, just kind of talking, pulling them aside virtually, if you will, and hey, what's going on, you know, because you, you discover a lot there. So great, great approach. And, you know, having the norms, I think is, uh, is important. Sure. What, one of the other questions here is thoughts about what's going to happen to kind of school libraries and maker spaces. Um, has anyone had a deal with that directly yet? Um, if I could, yeah. I, uh, our school district has actually um, been a part of uh, Get Epic, where uh, students can actually take out um, books online and it's like a, a library. And there are all kinds of different titles available. Uh, there are websites that, um, uh, uh, for example, the um, archive.org, where students can get books that have been online. And uh, although they're not getting the paper books, the you know physical book there they can read it virtually and the great thing about get epic is it actually keeps a book list it keeps the amount of hours that they are reading what they're reading where they're up to they have their own little little um, uh, log reading log if you will all right 
Well, we're getting to that point, and I apologize. I, we're not getting to all the questions here, but I want to respect everyone's time here that blocked off an hour. Um, just a huge thank you to all our panelists here um, for doing that, and then for all our attendees as well. I, I know you guys want answers too, and, and to attend and be seeking, seeking or seeking out for more resources, especially you know, at summer. This is normally a, you know when we're getting more breaks, and we can you know like have more chance to to add some perspective on it, and we're right into trying to solve problems and while we're also in a waiting game. So just thank you to all of you. And then also a thank you to Matthew Rogers and Kirsten Totterin, who are on the K-12 team. They were the ones that actually put all this together and all the work behind there. So really appreciate what they're, what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I think this is, I, if I was going to summarize what's going on, there's probably more questions than the answers right now. And we need to be prepared, but I love all the positivity. And, and the biggest thing for me is we've now proven that we can be adaptable. And, and I hope all of these things, we can make the positive things happen, even though it, it's just a lot of chaos right now. So as much as we can help, um, we do, um, you know, like we are available to do free consultations and do free drawings and layouts. So if there is anything that we can do, please let us know. Um, but thank you all for your time and uh, good luck to you. We, this is, we hope this is just, um, just part of the conversation that obviously is not over. So we want to continue to facilitate and uh, be a resource.